By 1846, war between the United States and Mexico seemed unavoidable. But neither side wanted to appear the aggressor. Who would make the first move? President Polk provokes a war with Mexico by sending troops into what most people claim is disputed territory, and that's the territory between the Nueces River and the Rio Grande River. The Mexican army is at the Rio Grande. They see the Americans cross over into what they see as Mexican land, and they attack them. And they kill 11 Americans and wounded several others. So what happens is, since Polk is claiming that the border is the Rio Grande, and the Mexicans are claiming it's Sanuesas, what Polk is able to say then is that the, the fighting took place on American land. After repeated menaces, Mexico has passed the boundary of the United States and shed American blood upon the American soil. The notion that Polk provoked the Mexican War is, I would think, controversial. I think a better case could be made for the fact that Mexico provoked a war with the United States. From the moment that the annexation was carried through, Mexico threatened war against the United States. On April 24th, 1846, General Arista, the Mexican general, declared that hostilities against the United States have begun, and at that point, this Mexican army crossed the Rio Grande and invaded Texas. So what is Polk to do? He felt that the Constitution joined him to defend a state of the Union against invasion from a foreign power. He had no choice. If you think of how the war is described in Mexico, it is known as the War of North American Invasion. I think from the, from the point of view of the government, the, the, the governing elite of Mexico at the time, uh, whose prestige was tied in to notions of sovereignty, as all governments are, the choice was really clear. There was no question that the territory had to be defended, and this is really what had been taking place all the way back to the Texas Revolution. With regard to the common people, though, too, I believe that there was a deep sense of outrage and injustice and a sense of American aggression and imperialism. In the U.S., war fever ran high, particularly in the South. The Mexican War was known to people throughout the United States in a better way than any episode had ever been known before. And uh, they took a considerable amount of, of pride uh, in the achievements of the armies and the Navy, because to them it meant that a democracy, a, re a, a republic with a democratic form of government, was fighting a military dictatorship and winning. Not all Americans were in favor of the war. This war is waged against an unoffending people, without just or adequate cause, for the purposes of conquest, with a design to extend slavery in violation of the Constitution. I will not bathe my hands in the blood of the people of Mexico. Several key individuals oppose the war. Henry David Thoreau opposes the war, and in fact writes on civil disobedience because of this. The other person who opposes the war is going to be Ralph Waldo Emerson. The United States will conquer Mexico, but it will be as the man who swallows the arsenic, which brings him down in turn. Mexico will poison us. Despite opposition at home, the United States quickly adopted an aggressive military strategy. Polk sent armies deep into Mexican territory. There's a three-pronged offense of Mexico. First, there's the Army of the West that goes into New Mexico and very easily defeats the New Mexicans. So then that army eventually goes to California and wins several battles there. And then there's the Army of the North that goes into Chihuahua in northern Mexico. Again, by early 1847, is able to capture Chihuahua, most of northern Mexico. And then there's the Army of the Occupation. And the Army of the Occupation under Winfield Scott 
goes down to Mexico, lands in Veracruz, and basically takes the same route that Cortez took to get to Mexico City. The United States had a much better organized military, much better equipped, uh, much better staffed, much better led. Many of the most famous military commanders, Robert E. Lee, Ulysses S. Grant, uh, various other uh, famous American generals of the Civil War, really cut their teeth in warfare in the Mexican campaign. So I think that in and of itself was the primary reason for the overwhelming of Mexico and the, and the forced capitulation. Again, however, the internal divisions politically in Mexico made it very difficult to govern. Uh, if it was difficult to govern in peacetime, which in fact it was, the first 20, 25 years of the Mexican Republic, the tensions of war, the draining of the treasury, uh, the, uh, the very difficult uh, uh, challenges made by uh, communications over mountainous and desert terrain, uh, it just was an impossible situation ultimately. When Mexico City surrendered on September 14, 1847, the war was over. The following year, with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, the United States consolidated its transcontinental empire. Mexico had to accept uh, that Texas was a state in the Union, uh, but the Treaty of, of Guadalupe Hidalgo provided for the uh, acquisition of uh, California New Mexico, for example, that whole southwestern area, how many states there are in that area, now become part of the United States. First of all, the treaty makes Mexico relinquish that land. But more importantly, I think, the way I see it, Article 9 is really important in that treaty because Article 9 is going to make the Mexicans living in those conquered lands going to make them U.S. citizens. According to the provisions of the treaty, all those Mexicans who, quote, elected to stay in the conquered territories uh, after one year uh, of the signing of the treaty were deemed to be American citizens with all the rights and responsibilities uh, at attached to that status. Native Americans obviously did not have this status at this time. African Americans obviously did not have this status at this time, even in the case of, of freed slaves. So this was a really actually a tremendous uh, boon to those people who chose to remain. The other provision that's important in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo is actually one, is an article that's not there, and that was Article 10. What Article 10 was supposed to do was supposed to guarantee Mexican land rights. And what the United States government does is that it omits Article 10 and basically says that even though you will not be guaranteed your land rights, if they are in dispute, you can bring those disputes before American tribunals and you will be given a fair hearing. Now what that does then is that it opens Mexican land to squatters, basically. Squatters look at Mexican land as public domain. The cost of litigation just to defend land titles in Texas, in New Mexico, in California was so onerous that oftentimes uh, Mexican landholders had to parcel out some of their land in payment to their attorneys. Uh, and to other people just to, to meet the growing legal costs that they face. So eventually, whether hook or by crook, uh, it wasn't a, a case always of uh, Mexicans being swindled out of their land, but eventually uh, the land holding base of the Mexican uh, elites uh, was, was chipped away over the next 10, 20 years. With the ratification of the treaty, the Mexican and Indian populations of California and New Mexico suddenly lived in a new country. Under the new regime, Mexicans were marginalized and discriminated against by Anglo settlers. For Indian peoples, over whom Mexico had exerted only minimal control, the change would bring war, loss of autonomy, and near extinction. For both Mexico and the United States, the war would have significant long-term consequences. 